Hello, beautiful souls. Thank you so much for clicking on this video. My name is Carolyn, and this channel is all about true crime, mystery, and anything abnormal. I highly recommend subscribing because this channel is definitely a vibe. I just wanted to say happy holidays to all of you. Whatever you celebrate, I hope you have an absolutely wonderful time. If you don't celebrate anything, I hope you enjoy having a few days off. I believe this video is going to go up on December 24th, no guarantees. But um, I really hope you enjoy the holiday season in whatever form or fashion that is for you. Today's story is a little bit less crime and a little bit more mystery. It's a story I was reading about that I found absolutely fascinating. So of course I had to come on and do a video to tell you guys all about it. The story is about the silent twins and the silent twins are June and Jennifer Gibson. June and Jennifer were daughters of Caribbean immigrants, Aubrey and Gloria Gibson. The Gibson family moved from Barbados to the UK in the early 1960s as part of the Windrush generation. The Windrush generation is the time right after World War II, a lot of people immigrated from the Caribbean to North America and to Europe. In this particular case, we're talking about Britain. And after World War II, because there were so many lives lost, once the war was over, all of North America and Europe was left with a lot of jobs that needed to be filled and not a lot of people to fill them. The British government encouraged mass migration from the Caribbean to Britain to fill the job shortage. This was the beginning of modern day British multicultural society. Aubrey the father got a job as a technician in the Royal Air Force and Gloria, the mother, was a stay-at-home housewife. The couple had a daughter named Greta who was born in 1957 and they had a son, David, who was born in 1959. In 1960, Aubrey got a position working in Yemen. He originally went on his own and a few years later, Gloria, his wife, and the two children that were already born went to join him. The twins who this story is about, they were born April 11th, 1963 at a military base in Yemen. In 1967, the couple had their fifth and final child and her name was Rosie. The family relocated to England first and then eventually ended up in Wales in 1974. When the father was interviewed many years later, he said that he had noticed from a very young age that the girls had a hard time speaking, that they learned to speak very late for kind of the average for a child. And he always felt the way they spoke, it wasn't the same as sort of what he noticed with his other children. The girls are twins and they are absolutely inseparable. The language they spoke was a very sped up version of Bayesian Creole. It made it very difficult for anyone to understand what they were saying. And even at a very young age and throughout their whole lives, a lot of times their parents or uh, teachers or anyone really that would hear them speak because not a lot of her people ended up hearing them speak but anyone who did hear them speak believed that they were not speaking English. The parents spoke Bayesian Creole as well so it wasn't that the parents didn't speak the dialect that the girls were speaking. It's that the girls would speak it so quickly and they would almost leave out or add words to the point where the parents could not understand anything that they said. The family was the only black family that lived in the community that they lived in. 
And this is the 1960s, so people were super ignorant AF. All five children were bullied and ostracized at school, and the kids that they went to school with were just absolutely cruel to them. But the twin girls got it the worst because they also didn't speak. They had selective mutism and they would only speak to each other. They would not speak at school ever and they wouldn't speak to anyone in the family. The only people they would speak to was each other and sometimes they would speak to their younger sister, Rosie. But other than each other, and very, very briefly, once in a while they'd speak to Rosie, but majority of the time they would only speak to each other and they would not speak to each other if anyone was around. The bullying at school was so bad that what the school started doing was letting the twins out of school early every day so that they could leave school and get home before the other kids would get out of school. All five children faced very harsh racism from a very early age. It seemed to affect the twins the most. They decided that they were just going to remove themselves from the world and live in their own world. There was a point where the school and the parents thought that the girls could not speak at all because no one ever heard them speak. But what the school ended up doing was they ended up putting the girls in a room behind a two-way mirror. So the girls are in a room, just the two of them, and then obviously behind the mirror, everyone can see into the room and they would monitor the girls. And what would happen is if anyone was in the room with the girls, they would not speak. They kept their heads down and they wouldn't speak at all. No, not even to each other. They were completely mute. But as soon as someone would leave the room and it was only the two of them in the room, they would start speaking to each other. And at this point, the parents and the school, because the school also got psychologists to come in to try to help the girls, the parents and the school and the psychologists, all of them believed that the girls had actually made up a completely separate language that was not English. The psychologist decided to record the girls speaking to each other. So they put a microphone in the room when they're behind the mirror and just recorded whatever it was the girls were saying to each other. So what the psychologist did, they took the recording of the girls speaking to each other and the psychologist slowed the recording down and then people started to realize they are using some English words, like some of the words they were saying were English words and some of them were just made up words. They would also use hand signals and no one could quite figure out how they communicated with these hand signals, but they had somehow created where some of the time they would be speaking and sometimes they would be making movements with their hands and in this way they were able to communicate with one another. And speaking was not the only concern. The girls had mirrored mannerisms and people really had a hard time figuring out how they would do it. So say for example, I was one of the twins and I had my twin sitting here beside me and we're both looking forward. One of the girls would take her hair and you know, put her hair behind her ear and the other sister would be doing the exact same mannerism at the same time. And it seemed that no matter what the mannerism was, it would only be done by both of them at the exact same time. They also ate in a very uh, strange manner. The girls would eat each bite. They would take a bite exactly in sync at the exact same time. 
But not only that, they would take extremely, extremely small bites of food and they would take a really long time in between bites. So they may take a tiny little bite and eat it both at the same time. And then they may sit there with their heads down for five minutes and then go and take another small bite. So for the girls to eat a meal, even a very small meal, it would take many hours for them to actually finish the food. The girls did continue to go to school, but they would not do any schoolwork. They wouldn't read, write, do any math. They would do absolutely nothing. The two girls would sit in their seats silent and kind of just keeping their heads down. And people started questioning, are they able to read and write or are they choosing not to? In 1974, the school brought in a new psychologist and this psychologist was determined to get these girls to speak. They knew that the girls could speak. They knew it was selective mutism and the psychologist really believed that they would be able to get the girls to speak. But no, nobody could get these girls to speak. And then they did something that I just think is absolutely horrific. They separated the girls. One girl stayed at the school she was at and another girl was sent to a boarding school. The minute the two girls were separated, they both became catatonic and they stayed that way until they were brought back together. Once the girls were brought back together, both of neither of them were catatonic anymore. They isolated themselves in their bedroom and they refused to come out and they refused to interact with anyone. The two of them would make up elaborate plays and stories. They would use their dolls and they would just play like normal little girls, just playing, making up stories, making up plays. The way the family found out what the girls were doing inside their bedroom was the girls had a little recorder. So they decided they would record the stories and plays as a gift to the, their younger sister, Rosie. It was always unclear to the parents and the teachers and any psychologist that they saw of exactly what the girl's capabilities were. They weren't sure how much the girls understood or how smart the girls were. And that was until 1979. For Christmas, in 1979, each girl was given a diary and this completely changed both of their lives forever. Once the girls got the diaries and they started writing these stories, they absolutely loved it. The two girls saved up and sent away for an online creative writing course. Each girl kept extensive diaries. They wrote stories and poems and novels. And I'm actually gonna read to you one of the things that they wrote. This was a diary entry written by Jennifer, which I think really, I found it absolutely amazing and so interesting. So I'm going to read to you a journal entry that was written by Jennifer. And this was the first time that anyone outside of the twins got any insight into what was going on inside the minds of these two girls. So Jennifer wrote, we have become fatal enemies in each other's eyes. We feel the irritating deadly rays come out of our bodies, stinging each other's skin. I say to myself, can I get rid of my own shadow? Impossible or not possible. Without my shadow, would I die? Without my shadow, would I gain life? To be free or left to die? Without my shadow, which I identify with, a face of misery, deception, and murder. So that's 
pretty dark. And it was very much believed until they started sharing these diary entries, which a lot of their diary entries were not shared with other people for quite a long time. But both of the girls in their diary entries very much expressed how they felt as though they were stuck as one and they couldn't decide if they wanted to be free of each other or almost if they would die without each other. It was such extremes in the way that they thought of whether they were together or separate. June wrote a novel called The Pepsi Cola Addict and the story was about a troubled boy who was groomed by a teacher and a security guard that worked at the school. Now, when June wrote it, she didn't use the word groomed because I don't believe that they used that in the 60s, but very much what she was describing is what we would refer to as grooming today. And the two girls pooled their unemployment benefits and had the book published. Jennifer then wrote a book herself. Now, this was never published, but she wrote it. And it was about a doctor who had a very sick child. And in the book, the doctor decides to kill the family dog, to take the heart out of the dog and put the dog's heart into the child's to save the child's life. And then the child takes on the spirit of the dog and the dog ends up destroying the father. So both girls, the things that they are writing are very dark. And this is just kind of a side note. I just wonder how they, came up with these things because for both girls they very rarely spoke obviously most of their lives later in the story one of them starts opening up to a journalist kind of giving a little bit more information but I just feel like the girls there must have been secrets that the girls had that they just kept to themselves and no one ever knew and obviously will probably never know so at this point, the girls are 18 years old. And in October 1981, the girls go on a five week spree of vandalism, burglary, and it ends with them trying to burn down a technical college that was near where they lived. Both girls pled guilty to burglary, theft, and arson. And it wouldn't be a true crime story if Broadmoor didn't come up. If you don't know, Broadmoor is a high security psychiatric hospital in England that houses the worst of the worst. I, I can't even imagine how many true crime stories I've read where the people end up in Broadmoor. But you've probably, if you're watching this channel, you've probably heard of Broadmoor. So the two girls get sentenced indefinitely to Broadmoor. Both girls hated being in Broadmoor. And when they entered Broadmoor, neither of them spoke again. The girls ended up being in Broadmoor for 11 years. They never spoke while they were in there and they were absolutely miserable. They both stopped writing because... They were just miserable being there and writing was such a passion and an outlet for them. It's just a shame that, you know, they lost that when they went into Broadmoor. And the girls later end up speaking with a journalist and they say to the journalist that every, you know, kid that would come in there who had done very similar things to them was held for two years and then released. And they believe they were held for 11 years because they refused to speak. The name of the journalist that they started speaking with was Marjorie Wallace. And I think in meeting Marjorie, I think the girls finally found someone they felt 
comfortable speaking with because the girls did open up a lot to Marjorie and Marjorie actually wrote a book and it's called The Silent Twins. I haven't read it, but I'm dying to read it. I went on to um, Amazon to try to order it because I thought, oh, I want to read it before I do the story. And for some reason, it's going to take four months for me to get a copy of a book from Amazon. I don't know what that's about because normally I can get a book in like three days. But um, yeah, I'm definitely interested in, to read that. But it's interesting that they found or actually the journalist found them. And she must have made them feel comfortable. And I think it's great that they found someone that they finally felt comfortable enough to speak with. So according to Wallace, the journalist, the two girls had a pact. And the pact was if one of the girls died, the other girl had to start speaking normally and living a normal life. It was during their time at Broadmoor where the girls came up with this idea that one of them had to die so that the other one could live what they considered a normal life. After much discussion between the two girls, June and Jennifer decided that Jennifer was the one who was going to die. Jennifer was willing to sacrifice her life so that June could live a quote unquote normal life. In March 1993, the girls were transferred from Broadmoor to Caswell Clinic in Wales, which was a much more open place for them to live. On arrival, Jennifer could not be woken up, so she was taken to the hospital and she ended up dying of a sudden inflammation of the heart. The doctors could find no medical explanation as to what caused this to happen to her. They also did a lot of blood tests looking for poisons or any types of drugs because the doctors believed she must have taken something that caused this. But no matter how many blood tests they did, no matter how much they tried to figure it out, it seemed that she had just died naturally. When police questioned June about what had happened to Jennifer, June said that Jennifer had been acting very strangely the day before she died. June said that Jennifer's speech was very slurred and Jennifer told June that she was dying. June said on the trip from Broadmoor to Caswell, Jennifer had slept in her lap the entire way with her eyes open. Wallace, the journalist, went to visit June a few days after Jennifer had died and she noticed that June was acting very strange. June said to Wallace, I'm free. I've been liberated. Jennifer gave up her life so that I can have a life. She also described it as a tsunami of her sins being washed away. And she was now, in her words, free of her sister. And as the girls had discussed, after Jennifer's death, June began speaking very freely. She gave lots of interviews to newspapers and magazines, and she spoke open and freely, unlike she ever had in her entire life. And the last update that I could find on June was from 2008, and she was living independently. She was living a very quiet, simple life in Wales, near where her parents lived. Greta, her sister, had done an interview in 2016 and she said that the family very much believed that Broadmoor had really destroyed both of the girls. Greta had actually said that she thought that they should sue Broadmoor, but that the parents felt that they shouldn't sue because it would never bring Jennifer back, so they didn't see the point. 
So that's the end of today's story. I'd love to hear in the comment section below what you guys think of this because I just found it absolutely fascinating. And I just want to thank you guys so much for all the support. You guys are absolutely amazing. Um, there's been so many new subscribers. You guys are liking and commenting. And I see so many of you sharing my videos on Instagram, which is just absolutely amazing. So if you know someone into true crime, over the holidays, you're going to be hanging out with them. Mention Abnormally Carolyn. And um, if you'd like to follow me on Instagram, it's just abnormally underscore Carolyn. So I hope you all have wonderful holidays, whatever you celebrate, or if it's just a nice vacation with a few days off, I hope you enjoy it. So I will see you in the next one.